All right. You ready? <laughs> I guess so. Here we go. This is Siri. The Daily Tech News Show by Tom Merritt is brought to you by all of the supporters at Patreon. If you also want to support Tom, go to patreon.com slash acedetect. That is patreon.com slash acedetect. And thanks as always for listening to The Daily Tech News Show. This is The Daily Tech News for today, which happens to be Thursday, June 4th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Mr. Justin Robert Young, podcaster and DTNS contributor extraordinaire. Not just ordinaire. No, yeah, uh, you know, you, you might expect a certain level of ordinaire. Sure. Not with me. I give yeah. you extra. Goes the extra flavor for that extra long <laughs> something. Uh, hey, we, uh, we're going to comb over this rumor that's been flitting around thanks to the Wall Street Journal. The Dish and T-Mobile USA are in merger talks. Uh, it's got the business world buzzing. It's got the media world buzzing. It's got the tech world buzzing. Uh, so we, we will tell you the details here in the headlines and then talk about it in a bit. Play that headline music. Wall Street Journal reports people familiar with the matter say Dish and T-Mobile USA having high-level talks uh, about a merger. The two companies agree on the form the combined entity would take. Dish's Charlie Ergen would be chairman. T-Mobile's John Legere is supposedly going to be CEO. That's the allegation from the people familiar with the matter. Uh, the thing the two sides have not agreed about yet is money. Ain't that always the way? Dish owns a lot of unused mobile spectrum, and every self-respecting wireless carrier in the U.S. dreams of marrying a video distributor someday, except for that jerk Verizon who we went and just bought on cue from Intel, dirtbag, gold digger. You know, just like the, the, the bully in the high school movie, Verizon, just having its way. You're with me on cue. On cue never loved you, Verizon. <laughs> Set the timer on your smartphone, people. Apple will begin selling some models of the Apple Watch in retail stores beginning in two weeks, according to TechCrunch. The watches will also go on sale in seven more countries on June 26, including... Italy, Mexico, Singapore, South Korea, Spain, Taiwan, and <gasps> Switzerland, the very backyard of so many fancy watchmakers. If you ordered an Apple Watch online in May, you should get it within two weeks unless it's the 42-millimeter space black stainless steel model, which has been the slowest to reach customers. Make you feel any better, Justin, about the delay on your own watch? Um... Yes, I mean, I guess now that I have it, right, like, I feel like all of that rage has subsided, and I'm now very, very happy with it, and I am now looking at this news as some kind of bellwether on where the install base is, and therefore where the app community is. That, that's all, I see this, and, and WD, WWDC coming up, and all I look at is, yay, a lot of people are buying it, which means people will want to make cool things that are very specifically tailored. We'll play around with it. VentureBeat reports that Yahoo announced several product closures, including Yahoo Pipes. There was a time when most of the podcasts I did ran through Yahoo Pipes. Mm -hmm. GeoPlanet's going to close down too. Place Spotter and even Yahoo Maps, although some maps functionality used by Search and products like Flickr will be kept running. Several international media properties will close down too, including Yahoo Music in France and Canada, the entire Yahoo homepage in the Philippines. Yahoo is also killing support for Yahoo Mail on older iOS devices. Uh, and let me see here. It looks like we have a pro tip from our producer, Jenny. If you work on any of these teams and your boss wants to meet you in a conference room, start grabbing kind bars from the kitchen. I remember back in the in the uh, mid aughts as podcasting was was uh, just getting its footing and, and looking at Yahoo Pipes as a distribution solution and realizing that something that was a bit behind the scenes you had to be a little nerdy to to really take advantage of it uh, was a tremendous litmus test of what people wanted to really look at on the internet in private because. Uh, the most popular uh, listed pipes were things that were, by and large, certain elements of pornography that you would not necessarily like to advertise to certain members of your family and friends. Yeah. Well, it was the uh, it was the forerunner of if this then that. Yeah. Except I guess what you're saying it was if this then whoa. Then uh, shh. 
Ars Technica reports that the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, has named six games to its new World Video Game Hall of Fame. Pong, Pac-Man, Super Mario Brothers, Tetris, Doom, and World of Warcraft were chosen by an advisory committee of about two dozen journalists, scholars, and game historians. The goal was to choose games that, quote, uh, have enjoyed popularity over a sustained period and have exerted influence on the video game industry or on popular culture and society in general. The inductees will be uh, included in a playable form at the museum's e-game revolution exhibit. Tom, so, you're, so World of Warcraft over Space Invaders, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I, you want to know what? I look at this, and of course, let's, let's preface this, all Hall of Fames are invented for two reasons, to recognize people who did great work in the field and primarily to generate interest, which is usually shorthand for argument. So there will always be argument about every Hall of Fame and the Video Game Hall of Fame will be no different. I kind of feel like all of these kind of could have been their own headline inductee. I don't know why you had to, I mean, Pong, Pac-Man, Super Mario Brothers, and Tetris certainly you kind of feel like could be, you know, a, a headline inductee in their own year, right? Mm -hmm. so I think it's interesting, especially to go in over Wolfenstein, which was, to me, the, the, the first big, uh, you know, first-person shooter that kind of, uh, I, you know, defined that genre. Doom was certainly, I guess, more popular. Yeah. Uh, but World of Warcraft also, it's like, I don't know. It, ju it just seems weird. That, no that Eve on online, no Sonic, no Zelda. Uh, you could get, you, we could go all day arguing about this. I feel like what they were trying to do is pick the pinnacle property in its in its genre slash period of time. So yeah, because you, you, they're listed here in order: Pong, then Pac-Man, and you know why it's not Zelda? Because Super Mario Brothers would just was just that much more popular than Legend of Zelda at that era. Then Tetris is like it launched its own kind of category. The Doom, puzzle. like you yeah. said, was the popularizer of that franchise. And World of Warcraft, same thing as Doom, right? Not the first, but definitely the most successful. So does World of, does World of Warcraft get the RPG slot? Because that that would be the one thing. The that, MMO RPG slot for yeah, sure. Yeah, right now, but there is no, there's no. Final yeah, game. you're right. There's no, there's no strategy games in here. Hello, SimCity, Civilization. What up? Uh, so yeah, let's drive drive on up to uh, Rochester. Grab yourself a garbage plate and uh, and and yell at the Strong Museum Advisory Committee. <laughs> Facebook is rolling out a new Android app that's designed to use less data and run faster for folks with spotty data connections, according to Reuters. Facebook Lite uses less than half a megabyte of data and supports Facebook's news feed, status updates, notifications, and photos. It does not support things like videos or advanced location services. Facebook Lite is available in select Asian countries and will soon be made available in parts of Latin America, Africa, and Europe. Uh, Facebook, Facebook, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Facebook also, I, I did that to myself. Facebook also turned off constant mapping right before the show, which is why I forgot to read this part. In Facebook Messenger, in anticipation of rolling out new features like one-time location sharing with friends through Messenger. So I'm, I'm so I'm actually more enthralled with Facebook Lite than the fact that they turned off the location thing in Messenger. I'm almost curious on whether or not this continues the, the fracture... Uh, nature of where Facebook is going app-wise to continue to just break out very little segments of what they do, not only in terms of the uh, apps that they purchase and kind of fold in, but in the messengerization, like what if there is just the timeline app and it really has nothing else but just a quick glance to your timeline? That's an interesting thought. I mean, the, the motivation for Facebook Lite is definitely markets where you only got 2G or you've got really expensive data uh, and people are very sensitive to, to using a lot of data. But that's, that doesn't mean they won't look at this and come up with ideas for other spinoff apps because they do seem to be looking for standalone apps. And when you look at a messaging platform like Line, uh, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, coming up with other successful apps on the platform is a successful strategy so far. Well, and it always seems odd to me whenever things are branded as less than another thing. Like Facebook Lite seems weird to me, whereas 
Facebook timeline seems like, oh, here's a solution for a problem I have. But yeah. that's market specific. Facebook Lite is going to play really well in parts of Asia, Latin America, Africa. Oh, I guess because, I mean like I guess the the product isn't necessarily it. It's just a matter of of you know how how we are to understand it. And hey, listen, it's their business. Here is something amazing. And Tom and I got into a big conversation uh, before the show about how rad this platform has become. All right, I'm going to pitch this here to you. What do you do when you want to have a nice conversation between just you and 200 of your closest friends? <laughs> Install Line's new Android app, Popcorn Buzz. That's what you do. As the next web tells it, it lets you use your Line messaging account to send out a link through email, text, or social network, and any of your Line contacts can join in and talk. It's voice only for now, but Line says it's working on group video chat, interconnectivity with Line groups, and, of course, an iOS version. Yeah. So, I mean, and this isn't the only line app that's in, independent of the line messaging app. They've got all kinds of music and shopping and payments, uh, et cetera. Uh, if this can handle, it's not going to handle 200 video chatting people at once, but if it can handle some kind of video chat as well, uh, I think they've got a Viber competitor, even a Skype competitor here well, um, for sure. What's crazy interesting about this is that line and messaging in general has become really, 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 really experimental and interesting. The, the plot, messaging as a platform has, has been remarkable. And I, because I always obsess about these things, I kind of feel like this is one of those the tech press needs to look back and apologize to a lot of these apps because it is it, the, the, the knock on them was, well, how are you going to make money? People, you know, a lot of these are either free or they don't cost much to use. And the only way you're going to make cash is by selling crazy stickers. And so beyond advertising in the way that we understand display advertising and add-on sticker stuff, really, I don't think people saw the, the, the big, bright, eclectic future that we are experiencing right now as, as short as like three years ago. It's remarkable. Yeah. I, I, people earlier this year were making sticker jokes about lines still, uh, just not quite understanding how successful the platform has been and that it's a platform, as you rightly said. BizTech Africa reports Zimbabwe's Dr. Lloyd Muzangwa and Tanzanian engineer George Kahabuka took home the mid-stage prize in the Standard Bank Water for Africa Challenge for their Maji 1200 water purification system. The mid-stage prize is given to systems ready for deployment. They've tested it. It's ready to go. The Maji 1200 combines UV light with solar energy to make water purification available not only off the grid, but with minimal maintenance. You just, you gotta change the bulb every once in a while and swap out the filter every once in a while, that's it. Team will use its $5,000 prize money to build and donate Maji 1200 units to schools in rural Zimbabwe. And they've got a crowdfunding project up and ready to go at gofundme.com slash O-H-Y-R-A-C. And this is definitely one of those, a little bit can go a long way. I mean, if they're going to be doing a lot with a $5,000 prize purse, you know, you can imagine what's something that could catch wind uh, in, in uh, you know, a crowdfunding sense could do. For oh, that. yeah. If, if you're operating, you know, a water system in, in rural Zimbabwe and you can spend less than a few thousand dollars to just have everything purified and not even add to your power bill, that's huge. Tom, I'm going to ask you to please ready the uh, sounder for this uh, for this next story. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, male or female? Uh, let's let's go male. Okay. All right. New data from IDC shows Xiaomi has risen to the world's second biggest seller of wearables, just behind Fitbit. TechCrunch reports that Xiaomi came in with 2.8 million shipments for Q1 2015 at 24.6% of the market, ahead of Garmin 6.1%, Samsung's 5.1%, and Jawbone's 4.4%. Fitbit still leads the pack at 3.9 million shipments, giving it a 34.2% market share. The data, very tellingly, does not include the Apple Watch, which just started shipping in April and will probably rock the boat just a little bit. This takes me back. It takes me back 
to the mid 2000s when we started seeing IDC break out smartphones, pre iPhone, by the way, from their phone selling data uh, to see like IDC starting to make some hay, get some attention around its wearables market share lists. Not that this is the first one they've ever put out, but uh, people are starting to pay attention, especially when you see names like Xiaomi jumping into the top of the list. Uh, and Fitbit's been dominating this. It's almost, that's probably why you haven't seen a lot of headlines around this because it's sort of like, well, yeah, Fitbit's up there, Jawbone's up there. It's what you would expect. So we're starting to see some volatility. And when that next list comes out and it shows the market share of Apple Watch, whether it's good or bad, everybody's going to pay attention. Certainly so. And at, at, at the end of the day, we really, you know, are doing a very 2005 show. I feel like that's, you know, we're, we're going back into time. And I think it's about time we get out of Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, uh, actually, in that case, it might be the opposite, depending who you ask. Verge reports that Nest will hold an event on Wednesday, June 17th, which would be its first substantial smart home product announcement since Google bought Nest. TechCrunch previously reported Nest might be moving into audio. Uh, a lot of people think maybe it's a, a some kind of wearable Google Glass uh, derivative. Uh, those people are probably crazy, but you know, and Nest means the whole home. Justin, what do you expect? I expect something that is clean and focused, and I feel like that to me is the litmus test for where Nest has gone since uh, their their acquisition by Google. Because I certainly hope that that remains what is their selling point, because that. You know, everything that they've done previous to that had always had a very clean, smart uh, industrial design to it. Let's take a look at the top two stories from our subreddit. We pay attention to that subreddit for all the stories we pick. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Griff72 submitted the top one. Yahoo Tech's Rafe Needleman reported that the updated Pebble app for Pebble Time is still delayed, even though people are getting their Pebble Time watches in Apple's App Store. Pebble got approval in the App Store on May 18th, but then found a minor bug, which they fixed and resubmitted within a couple days, uh, four days. They resubmitted on May 22nd, and even with that minor change, a, a previously approved app is waiting in review. Uh, the updated Android app, however, is available in Google Play. And Habachuela Condolce submitted the Engadget article noting a New York Times report that the U.S. Justice Department issued two memos to the NSA in 2012, allowing the NSA to search U.S. citizens' international data traffic without a warrant in order to find foreign hackers or malware. The memos allowed tracking of IP addresses and cyber signatures that could be tied to foreign governments. The memos were obtained in documents provided by a little fellow you might know by the name of Edward Snowden. He's not that small. He's a normal sized guy. No, he's, he's kind of a tall, he's actually a tall dude. I'm sorry. Yeah. My, my apologies to Eddie. Yeah, to Eddie. You, you can call him Eddie if you want. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is on the heels of the passage of the Freedom Act in the United States, which is a somewhat more restricted version of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Uh, and I think uh, it still amazes me that we are continuing to pull what are relevant revelations out of the Snowden documents uh, years later. It's years later now. Can you believe that? Yeah. Let's get into our discussion story because that's the headlines. Dish and T-Mobile, folks, going to get together. Charlie Ergen. Uh, you probably don't hear about him as much as John Legere, uh, but Ergen behind the scenes is just as much of a maverick. Legere's just cursy, and so he yeah, no, doesn't. He, you know, he, does, he doesn't drop a a, a, a mixtape on stage, uh, yeah. four letter words, whenever he gets up and does a, a talk or a product launch. But uh, you got two rogue uh, front coming from behind companies here. Dish is the number two satellite maker, which, you know, makes it low on the video, uh, bundled video providing role here in the United States. Uh, T-Mobile USA number four, but getting very close to catching Sprint for number three. They make a great match, Justin, in lots of ways. T-Mobile's big ding is they don't have quite the coverage. And even in places where they do have coverage, they don't have it in the more desirable 700 megahertz spectrum. Uh, so, it, it, in fact, uh, Sprint has more coverage than AT&T or Verizon spectrum-wise. It's just that AT&T and Verizon own more valuable spectrum uh, yeah. than Sprint does. Dish 
owns a lot of that valuable spectrum. They own a ton of uh, low band 700 megahertz spectrum. That's the easy to use spectrum. It easily goes through walls. Uh, and T-Mobile could make great use of that because Dish hasn't done anything with it. The rumor has been Dish wants to roll out their own service and they haven't. On the other side, uh, every carrier wants to have a video provider. Verizon bought OnQ from Intel, which all indications say is going to end up being some kind of mobile video service. AT&T is about to get approval to buy DirecTV. Uh, so it makes sense that, hey, T-Mobile wants to get into that game too. I don't see, I mean, is there a downside to this, Justin? For consumers, it doesn't immediately appear so. These are two of the very, uh, you know, probably top of the list in all industries of kind of consumer friendly, very, uh, you know, very disruptive in the kind of deals that they want to make and products and services that they want to offer. They are very consumer focused. Uh, it would seem that they are a match made in heaven the big question is exactly how does this work? So to understand that more, and I didn't, and Tom, you don't know about this, but I, I emailed a, uh, a source, and source, and I'm working the beat here, Tom. Nice. Uh, this is somebody who works at one of the major uh, mobile telecoms, uh, not T-Mobile. Uh, I asked uh, him for his opinion on basically where T-Mobile is in terms of spectrum and what the dish spectrum could help them with. Uh, he, you know, very much says that this could be a, a, a game changer, specifically for data. Uh, that if they are looking, and and that's really what you're looking for, especially if you are uh, looking to push more and more video content, that that's where not only uh, T-Mobile will be able to bolster their service, but more specifically, what they rely on right now is high speeds because they don't have a ton of people on their network the new dish uh, spectrum that they would get if they merge would help them uh, continue to sustain their speeds and not hit big uh, you know, product uh, dampening choke points, which would happen if they continue the growth that they've seen. So ex explain that again then. Uh, what this means is that uh, T-Mobile gets an advantage on AT&T and Verizon then. Uh, it certainly creates a, a pathway for them to continue to challenge them in the markets they are, that they already have good speed. That if they continue to grow at the level they were at now, you would see those speeds go down. The, the product would get worse. Just capacity, uh, a capacity problem. At capacity, because that's ultimately, whenever we really complain about AT&T and Verizon, it's not necessarily that they are not making available tremendous wonders uh, to, to get that kind of data to you. It is very often... The engineering problem to figure out how you do that in bigger cities that uh, continue to raise the bar in terms of how much data you get and that's a problem that t-mobile has not yet seen but could have been a problem if this dish mer a merger does not go through which is why they've looked to merge with sprint in the past well and and they still might face that problem if this you know i mean we know how long mergers take to, to first of all get formalized apparently the money's the issue here right yeah. uh, everybody's willing to play along with each other uh but it could take a while it may never happen at which point uh that is an interesting thing to know as a t-mobile subscriber in any case because even if this does happen then it has to go through regulatory approval uh t-mobile may start hitting that capacity issue before it would go through so one other thing that uh this uh my, my source points out is that dish has the high bid uh, for a ton of AWS 3 spectrum at the most recent auction. Oh, yeah. That's obviously done before these merger talks have, uh, have been made public. The winners have not been announced, and the high bid does not necessarily mean the winner. Part of what makes them a very attractive candidate for getting a lot of this spectrum is because the idea is to reward the small fry. If they are not looked at as the small fry anymore, it might affect their bid for even more of this spectrum, which could help bolster a combined product. Well, and their bid at the last auction is being challenged because they applied for small uh, operator discounts and Verizon and AT&T complained that they're, they're not doing anything with the, with the spectrum that they own. They shouldn't get any discounts. The discounts are meant to encourage small operators to be able to expand and Dish can't claim it's a small operator wanting to expand if it's never done anything 
with its spectrum. So they're kind of under attack from that end. And if they got T-Mobile, uh, they would be under attack from no longer the end of not using the spectrum, but the end of the thing. They're definitely not a small operator when they own the number four operator in the United States. And here's the big one. The 800-pound gorilla is the 600 uh, megahertz spectrum auction that goes next year on the block, uh, which a both T-Mobile and Dish were very expected to be players in. What does that mean for the bidding in terms uh, if they are a single entity at that point? Not only in how they are looked at by the people awarding the spectrum, but also what are their cash availability after the expensive process of merging? Does it make them more or less likely to win that new that, that big 600 uh, spectrum next year? Yeah, that's the white space spectrum that's being reclaimed from TV. That's incredibly valuable because you know it works. Television's been working for a long time, yeah. uh, and, and, and it's incredibly desirable. I still go back to that question of, like, could they even get this kind of merger done in time for that auction, which muddies that question you're bringing up even more. Yeah. If they've got a merger under regulatory approval at the same time that the same agency that's contributing to the regulatory approval is uh, conducting an auction at which they might want to try to get a discount uh, because they're two different companies, uh, you know, that's just going to complicate the bid uh, process. Uh, not to mention uh, the fact that the other people in that uh, in in the, that battle that wants to see the, those water those waters muddy as possible and a uh, 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 dish and T-Mobile with as many hands tied behind their back as possible have a lot of lobbying money in Washington and uh, can continue to make sure that every I and T is crossed on that merger uh, going forward. All right, but let's go to the other side of this because what T-Mobile gets is that spectrum advantage. And and even if they have problems with, with the auctions, Dish does own a lot of spectrum already. So that's going to help. T-Mobile yeah. gets video. And as I mentioned, AT&T wants direct TV. Verizon's got on cue. Uh, you know, this has become a matter of faith now that if you're a mobile carrier, you need to get into video somehow, and mostly because of the advertising that you can sell on it. On cue was was built was conceived as more of a of a console in your home, but Verizon seems to be pitching it as a mobile. Uh, service, which might still have a console element. It's very unclear. We're all working on secondhand information. Verizon hasn't announced anything yet, so we'll see what they do announce. But it does seem like it's coming out of the wireless side, not the Fios side. That said, we definitely know AT&T wants to get DirecTV, and here's why. Adobe put out a, a report about TV everywhere or authenticated TV. So this is where you've got a subscription, say with a direct TV or dish, and then you log in on your mobile device to get video from one of the channels. Like you log into the, the uh, Fox Now app, for instance. Adobe found that there were half a trillion page visits, 200 billion video starts, and 2.8 billion TV authentications for these kinds of property. Authenticated TV grew 300% year over year. And here's the kicker, 62% of it was on Apple devices. 30% on the iPad, 18% on iPhones, 17% on Android. And Apple TV is rising. They doubled their share to 10%, passing Roku. Uh, Roku back there in the back. In fact, boxes overall combined make up 24%. That includes not only Apple TV, Roku, but things like the Xbox, uh, Android TVs, etc. That, that's a big jump. They jumped from 6 to 24%. So the boxes are a rising category. But right now, mobile dominates. PCs only 7%. Macs only 3%. Smart TVs, forget about it, 2%. There you go. That's what they are looking at at these carriers saying, folks, uh, we need to get in on this uh, television business somehow and insert ourselves in that TV everywhere process and take a cut. In that not case, to, makes perfect sense. Not to mention the fact that as people talk less and less on phones and use the idea of voice minutes and stuff like that become less and less relevant and data becomes more and more, video eats up a lot of data. You can, like, like you mentioned, you can double dip and sell advertising on top of it. It seems to be a reasonable next lily pad for these gigantic behemoths to start to push money and resources toward while one element recedes. Uh, this would be gigantic, especially considering how uh, 
forward-thinking Dish and T-Mobile have both been. You could imagine that if they are a combined underdog against other behemoths, that the idea of very competitive pricing, consumer-friendly models for uh, switching, and uh, what Dish has made a name for recently of being the first one to really come out with a, hey, look, here's all of your cable that you would normally get, or a vast majority of it, uh, over the air, it seems like a match made in heaven, or at least something that uh, would would fundamentally kind of reshape where uh, this new world would go otherwise. And don't forget that Dish owns not only Sling Box, but Sling TV. Uh, hold your net neutrality gasps until the end of this sentence, but what if T-Mobile did for television what it's doing for music and had a pre-installed Sling TV app on all of its mobile devices that it supported? It's that's going to be the new battle, and and that's where we are going to see. Uh, you know, obviously Apple has a tremendous uh, advantage. You know, and, and in terms of how people are watching it, but if you're T-Mobile and you can offer, hey, get a device with us. You know, like and now all of a sudden, the idea of getting a tablet through T-Mobile or something seems like more of an interesting idea because it's your television. I mean, man, that seems yeah. pretty. And 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 then then there's the idea that Apple finally gets their television service off the ground, which by, by all accounts it's not going to happen at WWDC. Uh, but T-Mobile has been uh, working closely with Apple on things. If this merger went through, would that help or would that hurt it? Uh, a lot of the scuttlebutt I'm reading is that the biggest downside to any kind of merger like this is a lot of other companies simply don't like working with Charlie Ergen. Uh, so, or, you know, is that, is that going to be a negative or will John Legere be able to continue, uh, to strike deals and, and, and actually improve things for Dish in that respect? Who knows? I'm not saying Ergen's a bad guy at all. I'm just seeing people speculating on that. Yeah. I, I whenever this stuff happens, and, and this is the other element that I always get obsessed with, where did this story come from? Who, like, you know, who is talking to people within with knowledge of these talks that has that level of detail? This looks to me like something that was put out by some people close to this negotiation that wants to float it as a trial balloon, not only for regulatory purposes, but also uh, to kind of, I think, garner some good press. Because I think these are two companies that people think fondly of and would like to see do better, especially considering that their competitors are AT&T, Verizon, and, uh, and the like, which people do not necessarily have very fond feelings of it all all right let's get on to our pick of the day uh tuesday on episode 2506 we talked about the pinterest buy button patrick bezos suggested that someone finding a recipe on pinterest maybe in the future could use the button to add all the ingredients in the recipe to a shopping list well paul aka hot branch uh is enjoying January in Montreal, apparently, where Mother Nature is off her meds. Uh, had a suggestion for an app that does just what Patrick was asking. Asparagus My Recipes from asparagusapp.net. It's available on Android. It can pull down ingredients lists from web pages and categorize them for you. The paid version extends the ability of the free version, including the ability to scale a recipe up or down. You want to make just one serving, five servings, etc. Uh, Paul says, now when I find a recipe online that interests me, I share it to asparagus and voila, it's on my phone and tablet. That is great. I need to, I need to see whether or not... I was using a, an app called Big Oven, which swore it did this, and it didn't do it very well. So I'm going to check out uh, Asparagus and see if it does it better, because that's kind of amazing. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. And if I haven't removed Big Oven, well, now you know. <laughs> Our message of the day sent to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, you can send your messages there too, is from Joe. Joe just bought an Amazon Echo. Well, Justin, maybe you should read this. She arrived two weeks ago, and I must say I'm in tech love. She is extremely responsive to my voice. I most commonly ask her the time, weather, to set alarms or play music playlists. I sometimes ask her to tell me a joke of her other words of encouragement or empathy. She sounds really sincere. I especially like t lying in bed and having her read me the tech newscast for the day. The only thing I would have liked to see is the ability for her to recognize 
that I'm speaking to her without having to call her out, call her name before each command. It looks like Jibo can do this, but he is nearly $700 more. So I think I'll stick with my girl Alexa. Well, at least until we have a fight and break up. But for now, she's the one for me. Cheers, Joe. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, yeah, Joe likes his uh, Amazon Echo, and frankly, it's uh, the best written review of the Echo that we've got yet. Apologies to anybody else who said good reviews. You guys were great, but uh, I wasn't sure if this was acceptable for the show, to be honest. Uh, dude, it got a little hot and heavy, man. I feel like uh, people are going to be pulling over their cars listening to this. It <laughs> got real in, in a major way. Thank you, Joe, uh, for sending that. Uh, and thank you, Justin Robert Young. Always a pleasure, my friend. Indeed, indeed. Uh, it is, it's always great to be here, especially on, on big, fun news days like this. Yeah, we had, a, we had chock full of news. This was, this was good stuff today. Of course, uh, uh, just a programming note. I will be here Friday, of course, Monday, WWDC. I am off, uh, and I, the patrons know this, I'm off shooting in Seattle for another project Tuesday through Friday, but y'all are going to be in good hands. Uh, we've got a great schedule lined up for you, and then I'll be back the Monday after that. Uh, Justin Robert Young, you'll be in with me for the WWDC coverage on Monday. I can't wait for that. Uh, yeah, no, this is going to be really, 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 really cool, and uh, it's it's... You know, I, I'm I'm actually I think hopefully they launch music uh, uh, that day. It's gotta be right. I'm uh, I am itching, itching to get rid of my RDO subscription and go whole hog into whatever they would like to offer. And if I don't like that, then I'm going to Spotify. But I'm uh, on my free month of uh, Google Music All Access. Time's a wasting, Apple. If you want to yeah, try to win uh, me back. Uh, follow Justin Robert Young on the Twitters, twitter.com slash Justin R. Young. And, uh, of course, one of his many other projects. Which one you want to tell folks about? Uh, let's talk about, in the most family-friendly terms, uh, The Jury Show. It's a one-mic show in which I talk about whatever I'd like. If uh, you like some stuff that's a little bit more silly, a little bit more uh, contemplative, then, uh, then you will probably like that program. Uh, however, we hit a milestone on the Patreon for that, and the reward was that I would do an interview show. So now it is not a four episodes a month podcast. It is a five episodes a month podcast, and we did the first one yesterday. It is with somebody uh, by the name of Doxy. She is an ingenious woman, uh, uh, not only a blacksmith, but also a hardware manufacturer and... A cam girl. Aha. Uh -huh. And the, the next twist. for which you, uh, that she, she melds all of those things, I think. Well, she's a blacksmith. She should be able to meld things. Oh, she certainly does. She, she is a solderer. Uh, she is a, uh, a welder. Uh, no, it, it's, it, I thought it was very, very fascinating. If you, it, you know, it, it's, it's not uh, necessarily salacious or anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's more, uh, you know, Charlie Rose than Howard Stern in terms of the, the sex. Okay of it uh but if you have ever been interested in you know how much people make uh and also how to make an arduino based uh oh man i don't know i, I don't a, a something arduino based an arduino based thing that you might imagine a cam girl would use uh you know then then uh, go ahead and check it out J uh, jury that is uh, jurytalks.com it's free for everybody but if you'd like to support it it's patreon.com slash j-u-r-y Thank you, patrons, uh, for supporting so many different uh, projects out there, not just juries, but FSL Tonight, uh, This Week in Science, which I'm a patron of, uh, T2T2. Uh, it just makes so many things possible that were not possible before, and we appreciate Patreon. We appreciate our patrons uh, and the 5,051 people supporting us there. And if you don't support us there, that's fine. We love your support in any way possible. Uh, DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support has all the ways. PayPal, Bitcoin. Uh, or you can just tell folks about the show. I see people doing that on Twitter a lot, and I love every single one of them. Thank you for doing that. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live at AlphaGeekRadio.com and visit our website dailytechnewsshow.com tomorrow's friday that means darren kitchen and len peralta drawn talk to you then this podcast is part of the frog pants
Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>